to History Inside a Nutshell, the show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. In today's very special video, I am going to be releasing another interview with my friend and historian Jake Bilham to talk about one of the most incredible Titanic survivors. Violet Jessup. Although this interview was recorded back in July and before I started this YouTube channel, I've been hanging on to it for months and months, but now I have finally decided that it is the time to upload this interview in honour of Violet's birthday. So before we start the interview, let's just give a round of applause to Miss Violet Jessup, Miss Unsinkable, and wish her a very, very happy birthday. Hello. How are you? Nice to see you again. So. <laughs> you too. And um, how have you since um, the Titanic interview? Fantastic. Yeah, I'm really good. Yeah, I'm busy uh, with other Titanic projects and Britannic projects. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of research and a lot of um, document searching uh, on the Britannic mainly. Um, you know, I've come into, into you know, I've I've been going through the National Archives quite a bit, so I've been keeping them busy. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really good, though. I'm very very pleased to hear that. I mean, thank you. Oh, it's it's been a really quite a journey because speaking the Britannic as well, we're going all mm. Britannic themed because we there's are. one person that you've always wanted to talk about, and can you tell us who it is? Yeah, it's uh, Miss Unsinkable herself, Miss Violet Jessup. Um, she was just an amazing woman. Um, she survived many incidences with ships, but before that, even her life was at risk, even as a child, which we'll go into more that when, when we go through the questions. Um, so I just think this is a great, um, way to show that with within ourselves there's there's that 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 hero inside of that strength to just go on you know and it doesn't matter what life throws at us we're we're able to just soldier on mm. so and there's there's no appropriate moments than the current situation when with covid so i think this is a you know violet is the beacon of that doesn't matter what is thrown at us we can we can get through we can oh yeah definitely i mean violet i always loved violet as well she was one of like my favorite people that i know i actually secretly call her the britannic florence nightingale and i don't know why she was. <laughs> yeah she certainly was and oh. she was just a very caring and generous woman and i think you know, even after even after all what she'd been through, she's still she still had a very sharp mind. She was very strong, and I just don't know how she I don't know how she did it, but she did it. And I find I find find her as a as as you know as as a, a hero of you know just a, a, a role model. You know, it doesn't matter what we you know what I've been through or what you've been through or anybody's been through. Violet shows you that we can get through oh yeah and uh, i know that um during the course of like the interview as well jake you have been showing a very 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 rare interview that was recorded um yeah. by a violet's friend who i believe is john graham yeah that's right it was uh, excuse me the bell doorbell has just gone on gone yeah. off um yeah, uh, John John became very close with Violet and Violet didn't give many interviews out and she didn't really speak about her experiences. But John John became sort of a very close friend slash family um, and they, they knew, each other, knew, knew each other very well. And Gray, John approached her and said, you know, would you be willing to do a, a voice recording, an interview? And it was actually recorded in 1971, uh, sorry, 1970. Uh, so it was a year before Violet 
actually passed away. And uh, it was for her book, uh, sorry, for his book uh, that he was writing called The Only Way to Cross, which was a shipping um, book. It was just, I've never read it. I, I, would, I want to read it, but I've never read it. Uh, but what I've heard, it's such an amazing book. And um, John really um, goes into the, 20, the early 20th century of transatlantic voyages, what it was like to be on board a ship. Uh, he really wanted you to feel that you were on the ships that he was talking about, whether that be the, the Titanic, the Mauritania, the Lusitania, um, or even the Aquitania. He really had a love for these ships and, and transatlantic in the early 20th century. And John used to do a lot of talks as well. He used to go around the country and America and all those sort of places and do talks about ocean liners, whether that be Titanic or other ships. And while it was just very quiet, she didn't really like talking about her experiences. She never really spoke about them. She never really wanted to speak to speak about them. She just didn't see it as a significance in her life. It was just something that had happened and that was it. She just got on with it and she just soldiered on. And it, in fact, even her own family didn't know that she'd survived the Titanic or even the Britannic. They didn't know, not one. You know, it was only years later that they found out that she was on these ships and that she'd survived so many. It's just, it's just crazy. That's <laughs> mind she, blowing. It is. Violet used to love to collect stuff. Uh, her, her niece said that when she used to visit Violet, her aunt, um, she used to have like, you know, um, monuments of where she'd been, you know, like uh, she's, what was, I mean, I remember her, uh, her saying that she had this um, alligator thing and it used to scare her as a child but she had this alligator I don't know what it was what it was but it was like an ornament ornament or something that was very scary uh, but she collected it from her travels and she was just this is what I mean she was just an amazing woman she really was wow she lived oh. a life oh. yes I, I mean I wish she was my best friend really <laughs> I do I do <laughs> oh she's so amazing but then we'll go have to get on straight to the point really because to order, yep. order to understand Violet's story we mm. have to go back to the time of the Britannic because that's mm. what the interview was based on that John recorded with her so to understand that's Violet right. we have to understand the Britannic as well yep. so that's right. I think we, we actually touched on the idea behind John's interview, but mm. can you tell us a little bit about the Britannic um, for those who don't know, Jake? Of course. Uh, the Britannic was the third and final of the Olympic class liners. Uh, she was laid down on uh, the keel of, was, of, of Britannic was laid down on the 30th of November 1911. She was sort of um they didn't actually agree straight away that we're going to build the third one they were going to see how the other two ran first mainly the olympic and once the olympic had finished her voyages and seen how well she 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 handled and how popular she really was it was then that uh jay bruce ismay said let's order the third ship and finally she was laid down on the 30th of november 1911 uh, it took three years to build the, the Britannic, just like her sisters, the Titanic and Olympic. She was built in the same spot as Olympic in, uh, in um, Gantry 2, uh, Arrow Gantry 2. When the Titanic had sank, now, uh, well, a lot of people think that the Britannic's name was going to be Gigantic. There was a lot of, you know, rumours that she was going to be called Gigantic. Unfortunately, there is no evidence to support that Britannic was going to be called gigantic. It was more rumoured than actual fact. Uh, there is one document from Hingley's, the, which was the anchor. When they ordered the anchor, they had a letter sent to them, or they got a letter 
that it said that which said gigantic on it and also there was an order form uh, book shall we say book uh, that they put gigantic and then crossed it out and placed it with Britannic but Harland and Wolf and White Star Line all documentation from them supports the name Britannic from very early on even before Titanic left Belfast um, because people think that she was her name was changed to Britannic after the Titanic had sank. It's not the case. Britannic was given her name right back as, as early as June 1911, so months and months before Titanic left Belfast. When the Titanic sank, they had to change some stuff on the Britannic for safety reasons. They had learnt from the British Board of Trade findings uh, from the disaster. Construction was halted for a little bit on Britannic so they could go back to the drawing board and basically make Britannic safer. And uh, looking off Britannic was very early on in the construction, very early on. They hadn't even put the plates on the, on the hull yet. And then to make her safer, what they had to do was uh, double hull her. So she had a double hull. So in case of an iceberg, incident that only one layer of skin would be damaged or would contain the sink you know the water that was she was taking on uh, the bulkheads were were raised right up to the bridge deck which was b deck because on the titanic they only went as far as e deck which in a, in a sense that was what in a way failed her because water was able to flow over the tops of one bulkhead to another that's what they stopped on Britannic. They raised them up. They also added another bulkhead, so she went so she went from fifteen uh, watertight compartments to sixteen. So Britannic was able to stay afloat with six compartments flooded, which made her, in a, in a essence, more unsinkable than Titanic and a lot more safe. And the Britannic was um, equipped with what they call gantry davits. With the Titanic, there was what they called the welling davits, which was more manual. Uh, you had to crank the lifeboat out and in, and you'd have to attach and everything. It was just a very complicated and very slow uh, way of getting lifeboats off. Doesn't mean that that's what failed Titanic. In fact, you know, the welling davits were well designed for the time, um, but with Britannic, they needed more, an effi- more of a, a, an efficient way of getting off the ship safely. And the gantry davits were so huge that they had to strengthen Britannic in eight different places because she was supposed to have eight gantry davits all together. Now, they were very expensive to fit, so they didn't really take off in the old shipping business. Uh, only a few ships in history that ever had these gantry davits, and some and the ones that, that came after Britannic were on a smaller scale. But they also led to what we have now, electronic, ele- you know, the electronically way of getting lifeboats off. They were run by electric, and what they would have to do was, uh, how they were run, there was a switch box on the boat deck, and you was able to control the davits that way, the gantry davits. Um, Unfortunately, when Britannic was launched on the 26th of February 1914, the war broke out in August 1914. And during this time, uh, during that time, from the day she was launched to the day the war broke out, they were trans, they were obviously putting her into, trying to put her into passenger service, doing, putting all the passenger uh, facilities on for what she was supposed to be. And then the war broke out and Holland and Wolf uh, stopped all construction on Britannic and she was laid up for about six months before anything was done on her. And by the, she was an empty shell. She hadn't been painted or, excuse me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the Britannic was an empty shell and uh, Holland and Wolf stripped back on uh, performing anything on passenger service trade. So they had to make sure all their resources were, were put into the war effort. So like building battleships and things like that and doing other things too, uh, to, to aid in the war effort. But also obviously men were called into the war too. So they were very, they had a minimum amount of staff that could 
work on a certain ship at a time. And then the Admiralty decided that because the, the casualties were, were rising and they had no really sufficient way of getting, I mean, this is before planes ever, you know, aviation came in. So the only way to get, to transport these people, these soldiers, these wounded soldiers was by sea, ocean, you know, so they had to use ships. And a lot of these were used from commercial ships, passenger ships, such as Britannic. The, the Admiralty decided to use Britannic as hospital ship because uh, Britannic was a big ship. She could fit over three and a half thousand pass soldiers, wounded soldiers on the ship. Obviously, all the, well, then all the effort was to put Britannic into passenger uh, hospital service. So she was painted white. The internet uh, and she was painted with a green band along the starboard and port hull, uh, along the hull, uh, stretched from bow to stern. She was painted with three red crosses on both sides. They were illuminated by a spotlight so that at night time, that uh, a U boat couldn't, you know, you, she was a she was a possible ship, so they couldn't mistake her. So she was attacked, or if they were going to attack her, that they would see. That she was a hospital ship. There, she was illuminated also by green lights as well at night time and then she also had green uh, big red crosses which would illuminate at night time too on the boat deck. Her uh, funnels were painted yellow so she was painted into the international recognized colors as a hospital ship so that the Germans would know not to attack because she was under protective uh, services. White Star Line came up with an agreement with the British Admiralty that they would use, uh, they would pay the White Star Line after they used the Britannic, that they would pay them £75,000, which was a lot of money back in those days to use Britannic. Britannic was also in, uh, insured through the British government as well. So she was like a mortgage type thing. So if anything happened to her, the White Star Line would receive money from the British government. Britannic, unfortunately, because of how quickly she was raced into hospital service, only five of her original gantry davits were ever fitted. The rest was, she was fitted with uh, welling davits to take, you know, to make up the loss of the other three um, gantry davits that she was supposed to have. And so her lifeboat capacity was much more than Titanic's. Britannic had a successful successful trip uh, as a hospital ship she was very successful she had six up to, well sorry five successful voyages as a hospital uh, she brought over more than probably more than 10,000 wounded soldiers Violet was one of these people that would be on Britannic <laughs> at the time uh, Britannic unfortunately she, she was going to be handed back to the White Star Line. And it, as agreed, the White Star Line was paid £75,000. And she was handed back to the White Star Line because the numbers of casualties were dropping. So they didn't really see the, the purpose, why they were... They couldn't come up with a, uh, a reason why Britannic would be kept in hospital service. So in June 1916, she was handed back to the White Star Line. And then she was being... Uh, transformed into hospital uh, passenger ship. But in August 1916, she was recalled back into hospital service because numbers were rising again. Uh, so they needed her. And again, she, she had another successful voyage. And then she, was, she wasn't supposed to go out on the, the voyage, on her tragic voyage. Uh, it was actually supposed to be the Aquitania but the Aquitaine had been damaged in a storm. And unfortunately, they couldn't send the Aquitaine out. She had to be returned to her builders to be repaired. And uh, Britannic went out instead. Britannic uh, landed in Naples in, on, in, on the 17th of November, 1916, for her coal refuelling. And then she left. Unfortunately, there was a storm, so they couldn't get her out. The, the, the captain wouldn't risk getting the Britannic out of Naples. Uh, in case they damaged the ship because the storm was so big that they, they were scared that they would, they would, you know, cause some damage. So he stayed at port until around the 20th, 19th to the 20th of November, 
and he finally but well, after they left the seas rose again so it was a, it was a so it was it was pretty bad um uh, so it was like they were waiting for the storm to go and then they they left and the storm came back again and um, oh. yeah but luckily no she wasn't damaged and then in the morning of November 21st, 1916, she was traveling through the Kia Strait or the Zia Strait, depends how you pronounce it. And uh, at 8.12 a.m., there was a muffled explosion. She had struck a mine. Uh, well, they thought it was on, the, on board the ship. They thought the ship had struck a torpedo. She'd been struck by a torpedo, but actually it was a mine. It was later found that it wasn't mine. Everybody was sat down at breakfast at the time. And as soon as the explosion took hold, it was, it, as soon as that had happened, everyone seemed to rise out of their chairs and then move, you know, and get out of there. They just wanted to get out. Um, the Britannic, unfortunately, uh, had damaged, she, the explosion took place between holds two and three and she damaged four of her compartments. She was taking water on very quickly uh, at this point, and she'd also damaged a fireman's tunnel too. Uh, because of the explosion, it was thought that Britannic had warped her steel, and some of the doors, watertight doors, had been left open because there'd been a night, from the night shift to the day shift, there'd been a swap between the staff, you know, the boy at the fireman and the trimmers and all that from the night staff to the day staff and these doors were opened so that people could, the, the crew could get through easily from one foot to their designated area so when the explosion took place these doors were wide open and because the ship had walked, uh, walked her steel some two of the doors was left wide open allowing sea to flow through the ship so the ship had a big hole in her and she was taking on a lot of water and she was going down very quickly by the bow. Within the first 15 minutes of her striking the mine, she was in the same condition that took Titanic within an hour. So she was in the same condition. She was really bad. Now, some of the nurses, now you can imagine the Aegean Ocean, they're heading towards Greece and it's warm it's hot and what they needed what they wanted to do was the doctors had ordered the the nurses to open the portals on the lower decks to ventilate the wards for the soldiers that would be taken on at uh, lemnos and that's where she was heading anyway she she was taken on water and these portals had been left open and normally these portals would be normally about 20 foot above water level. Well, within very quickly, these, these portals were being submerged and you only need at least 12 portals to be submerged for the damage that had originally been done to her to double. And that's what happened. Portals were being submerged and the ship was taking on water that so the compartments that hadn't been affected were now being affected by water coming through these portals and sinking her very quickly. So even though Britannic was able to stay afloat with six compartments flooded, she was flooding a lot more than that, a lot more. So she was no way going to survive. So the captain wanted to beach the ship. And he was steaming towards the island of Kia, which was only a few miles off. But for some reason, the rudder failed to work. It wasn't working. So they couldn't steer the ship. So somehow the explosion had caused the rudder to knock out somehow. Uh, so they had to use the engines on the port side of the ship to move the ship towards Kia, which was not the, the done thing, but it had to be done. Also, some of the cables for the... To, to, that was connected to the, um, the telegraphs to command the engines had also been damaged. So they were not responding. So they had to use the emergency telegraph to get messages down commands to the engine room. So they were pushing the ship 
towards Kia, and she was only moving because of the weight of the weight of the water in the ship. She was. It was like having four flat tires in your car. Gosh. So it was. She was in a bad way, and some of the crew had decided to launch the lifeboats before the captain gave the order to abandon ship because they they were panicking. And two of the life, but two lifeboats had been launched from the stern. Lucky enough, they got away safely, without no incident. But they were asked to come back to the ship to pick up swimmers from the the ocean. And then two more lifeboats were launched, but they weren't so lucky at getting away safely. Well, as the ship was sinking and she was she was going down starboard side, and the the port propeller was the the propeller that was pushing the ship and saving the ship towards Kia. He wanted to beach the ship to stop the ship from sinking. So he wanted to shallow the ship. And um, so, so two lifeboats were launched and they were churned up in the propellers. And um, it's really sad really because Britannic had the the capability of getting everybody off that ship safely, but they died. People died of the very same of the very thing that was supposed to get them off, perfectly fine, perfectly safe. And it took so those lifeboats were churned up, and they caused the only casualties in the sinking. And the Britannic finally sank uh, fifty-five minutes after the explosion. Uh, so. Le- more than half the time it took the Titanic to sink. So the ship that was supposed to be safer than the Titanic, and lessons learned from the Titanic sinking, all those safety features were all done either by the explosion from the original impact or by human error. So human error took Britannic down, in essence, because they kept the portals open. So and if those doors had been closed, it would have guaranteed Britannic safety. And she would have made it to land, or she might have even been able to make it to Lemnos under her own steam. But because of those chain reactions of those humans on board the ship brought her down and she, she ended up on the Aegean Sea floor. So yeah, it's really, tragic really Mm. I can understand it it is really tragic I mean I mean the Britannic is such an underrated ship not as like as well known as the Titanic but you've got to really understand and sympathize the sinking of it because you're in the middle of the first world war there's open Mm. sea and there's nothing you can really do in this situation at all and help was a little bit more harder to find despite where the Britannic sank because I believe it sank near an island. Island of Kia. Yeah, that's right. She sank off the island of Kia. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, the problem is, is when Britannic was struck by the mine, um, it had, uh, her cables had snapped. Uh, so the the cables that ran along the, the, um, the masts, they were connected to, so they were the aerial, you know, for the wireless machine. But the, when the explosion took place, it had whipped the cables and snapped them. So connections were lost to the silent room, but they, they were able to send out distress signals, but they were not able to receive them. So they weren't re- able to receive a reply. Uh, so lucky enough, they were able to send out distress calls. So. Um, ships in the that were nearby, you know, Greek fishermen and you know trawlers and all that were able to rescue the survivors, but they did not come until the ship had gone down. Um, so, yeah, it, it. I don't know why it took that long. I mean, it could have been the speed. I don't know. It could have been that they were worried that if the ship had been torpedoed, that they might be in the firing line too. But um, no, but after the after the sinking, they were able to pick up survivors from the Britannic. Uh, so yeah, it is very tragic. It's very tragic, and I think t- the, the Titanic overshadows the Britannic because of because 
it happened during the First World War. So she was a casualty of war, which a lot of ships were, and people were dying through the war. So, so I think she was forgotten because of that. But I think people miss the point with Britannic. You see, Titanic, it doesn't matter how you were going to slice it, she was, she was going to take passengers down with her. And they were going to die because of the cold waters and the amount of life posts that were on her. She was going to go down and people were going to die. With Britannic, there was no need for deaths. There was no need for them to die because they had enough lifeboats and they had more than enough lifeboats to get everyone off safely and they had the means to get people off safely. Those Gantry Davids worked and they were brilliant. They, they did what they were supposed to do, but deaths were caused because people were so eager to get off the ship that they didn't listen to the captain and they didn't wait for the, the abandoned ship command because... You know, I mean, the Lusitania had only sunk only a year before. So obviously that was fresh in people's minds and ships were sinking right, left and centre. So though, even though Britannic was under a protective, protected status, didn't stop people from thinking, OK, when are we going to be torpedoed? So they had that in the back of their minds all the time. So when the, when the mine struck, obviously, uh, especially the boilermen, they would have seen the first sort of death slashes to the Britannic and water was coming into their areas. So they would have seen all this and obviously they would have been panicking. So they were the, and they were the ones that launched the lifeboats without command. So it was, it was just a tragic, I mean, Titanic, people died because they weren't in a lifeboat. Britannic, People died because they were. And that's what people forget. We've got to jump into Miss Violet Jessup herself, really, because, yes. oh my goodness, what a story she has got to tell, really. And yeah. I know I cannot get over her story so many times, especially with Britannic. And if you've never heard the interview, I would recommend listening to it because it will yeah. blow your mind. I, it did with me for the very first time. But when I looked at Violet's story to begin with, I, mm. she was a trooper from the very beginning. Violet was, when she was very young, uh, she, she was born to a... Catherine and William Jessup, and they were Irish immigrants, and um, they had emigrated to Argentina. And Violet was born there, and she had uh, nine siblings, and only six of the siblings survived. Violet was told, well, the pa her parents were told that she was suffering with TB, and she and the doctor that had diagnosed her with it. Uh, she gave her like maybe days, weeks to live. She didn't have very long, but she survived. And she managed to, and usually TB is a really bad disease and it does take a lot of lives, even today. Even with all the medical you know, technology we have today, it's still dangerous to, to, to get. And she survived it. So she was, a, she was a survivor right from the beginning, right from the beginning. When her father passed away, uh, her mother and Violet and her siblings emigrated back to England. And Violet's mother was also a stewardess. She'd got a job on board the Royal Mail, uh, the Royal Mail line, and she was also a stewardess. But and then Violet also uh, was she attended a co convent school uh, while she was young, and then her mother fell ill too. So Violet had to sort of take the role of the breadwinner, the one that brought the, the wage in, because uh, her mother couldn't work anymore. So Violet took a job with the Royal Mail Line in 1908, and her first ship was the Orinoco. Uh, I think I pronounced that right. I can never pronounce it. <laughs> um, and uh, so that was her first um, trip out as a stewardess. And um, then, the reason why she chose the Royal Mail Line is that Violet didn't really want to, you know, take the transatlantic line uh, because, which would be like the White Star Line, Cunard. She didn't like the storms that the, that the Atlantic was would throw at them. But in the end, uh, she took, she, she was hired by the White Star Line. So she got a job with the White Star Line and she boarded the brand new 
of the, the first of the Olympic class, the Olympic in 1911. Unfortunately, in September 1911, the Olympics struck another ship called the Hawk, the, HM, uh, the HMS Hawk. Now, Hawk came off worse. She had a crumpled bow and the, 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 the Olympic hardly had any damage at all. She only flooded two compartments. She was able to get home under her own steam. Violet was on board at the time. And uh, so again, another brushed with death and she escaped. The unsinkability of Titanic uh, would be in enhanced, enhanced by the Olympic collision. Um, the West Star Line was blamed for the incident because they thought the Olympic was too big and the engines were too big and they were too big to get through docks and everything and they would suck ships in. And the Titanic also had a near miss too. So it does beg to differ, like maybe they were kind of right <laughs> in some ways because <laughs> it because the Titanic also sucked in another ship and nearly collided with the Titanic on a maiden voyage. Um, so Violet survived and then she went on to board the Titanic as a stewardess and she was on the Olympics she was paid two pounds ten shillings and she'd have to work 17 hours 17 hours straight Ooh. yes uh, again so then on the Titanic she she didn't really want to go on the Titanic but she was persuaded by her friends that it might be fun let's go <laughs> she she did and she boarded the titanic on the 10th of april 1912 and uh, she she mentions that during the voyage she she loved thomas andrews she commented on thomas she came across thomas on many occasions as a tired but always with a smile on his face Aww. he was always cheerful he would always speak to the staff and in many cases would take suggestions off, on, off, you know, off them to improve maybe the third ship, the Britannic. But she always commented on how cheerful and bright he were and would always stop for a chat all the time with the staff. It, the staff just loved him. And uh, she must have been really heartbroken when she found that he didn't survive the sinking. So Violet... There's not really much on, um, you know, what she did during the voyage, but I know that she made friends with also Jock Kuhn, who was the youngest of the, the band on the Titanic, the, one of the violinists. There was a, some sort of friendship between them. Then when the Titanic struck the iceberg, uh, Violet said that, um, that there wasn't any sort of immediate panic or anything that seemed wrong or anything out of the ordinary. She was just told to gather the passengers and you know get their life jackets on and things like that. And she said that she was placed in lifeboat number 16 and she called, she called the, the officer Mason that was in charge of lowering the lifeboat, which more than likely was Moody, six, off, six, off of, six officer, officer Moody, who was in charge of lowering that lifeboat at the time. She was past a baby, and uh, she, she said that the Officer Mason just threw me, just handed me this baby and said, we take care of this child. Um, so when she was lowered away from the Titanic, she just said it was just horrible. The noises, the screams, and it was just a dreadful night. So she survived that, but she never, she never commented on it, really. I mean, she did win later life when her memoirs was done and the interview, the voice interview, but she never really spoke about it. And she said when she got on the Carpathia the next morning, she said, this woman came up to her and took the baby off her. She didn't know who she was or where she came from. She just grabbed this baby and just went and didn't say anything. So she just gathered that might have been the mother of the child. She said years later that during the stormy night in her cottage, she, um, she, <laughs> she, she said that she, this phone rang. She said a phone rang and she picked up the phone and on the, on the other end of the phone, there was this gentleman 
And she and he said, do you remember the night the Titanic went down? Yes. Do you remember a baby being handed to you? Yes. I was that baby. And I, he laughed and he hung up, didn't he? She laughed, she laughed and she put the phone down because she thought it might have been the children in the neighborhood, you know, joking with her, messing with her, uh, just doing pranks. After the Titanic, uh, she trained uh, during, obviously during her time, she trained as a nurse when the war broke out. And then she would be, she was put with the Britannic. She was told to go and appoint, she was appointed to the Britannic. So she joined the Britannic. Now you can imagine someone who survived a Titanic disaster, then going to serve on the third sister, which was near as identical as the Titanic. You would have been scared, but she did it. And she boarded the, the Britannic uh, she said one of the things that she found when she was on the Titanic, she didn't take any belongings with her when the ship went, when she left the ship. Her toothbrush went down with her. She just had barely nothing with her. She wouldn't make that mistake again. And her brother joked with her, if you're on another sinking ship, sis, make sure you take your toothbrush with you. <laughs> put, your toothbrush, put your toothbrush in your pocket. <laughs> It really, yeah. it really sort of, yeah, it, it stirred the pot with her. I suppose, in a way, he was right. Um, so when the, the Britannic struck the mine, she said suddenly everyone jumped up. But she was looking after this other nurse that had been sick, whether she, probably seasickness, and she was just totally useless. She couldn't do anything by herself. So she had to really take charge of this nurse, and she help dress her and everything. I was still intent taking this nurse on back. <laughs> was to collect my pat about her right. and my piece of toast and a roll and make a pot of tea as quick there because the pantry was empty by there and I was just left alone uh, and go down to her. And by that time, you see, two, two sisters uh, occupied, each, uh, each cabin had two. Right. Well, her... The, the sick one was still in bed, looking very white and frightened, and the other one was getting her things, and I, I said, it, it's all right, I'll look after sister so-and-so. And I said, no, you must get up, and I'll dress you. And uh, I could see she was trembling, she wouldn't be any good at all, so I decided to let her keep her pyjamas on, you see. Mm. And I said, I'm going to put your uniform over your pyjamas, because you may have to climb down a ladder, mm -hmm. and it would be better for you. And... Uh, it took me so long, and I made her take some of this tea and a bit of roll and that yeah. while I was dressing her. And um, finally, I said to this other, don't worry, I'll take her up the stairs when I've got her dressed. And when I took her up the stairs, the young officer who was at the sort of door, you know, he, he nearly went white because he said, all the nurses have gone. Mm. So I said, well, I've had to dress this nurse, and she was quite useless, she couldn't do a thing. So um, he said, well, I'll take her along because they, uh, they're all, uh, more or less, the boat's ready to be lowered. And then she went up onto the boat deck and she was placed in lifeboat number four. And she said that the ship was sinking. You could tell that she was sinking. She was down by the head. Um, even though she was a big ship, you could tell that she was going down by the, that the head was down. Um, and she said she was put in lifeboat number four and she was lowered away in the lifeboat. Now, Violet put her jacket, her, her coat, because she wanted to look good for her, for her brother. Even though it was her brother, she wanted to look nice. So she put her jacket over her life jacket. And she said, you know, if I, if I had ever seen a passenger do that, I would have killed them. It's because she used to say to the passengers, make sure you put your life jacket over your clothes. But this time she put her, her life jacket and she put a coat over it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so she, said I, so she said, if I'd seen a passenger do that, she'd have murdered them. She, oh. she would have screamed murder. Anyway, Violet never learned to swim. She didn't know how to swim. And she said, 
when they were lowered away and the ship was still moving and she thought it was a little bit strange but she, the, the ship was still moving and there was this bellboy hanging from the ship and they told him to drop into the boat because he was only a young boy and anyway she said um they were they were they were going ahead and then she wondered why everyone was jumping out everyone was just jumping out the boat and then she saw why so she had to jump it was either that or get caught up in the propeller i um when i was left alone you see and i decided um which would it be better to be cut the pieces or drown i mean i had to make the decision so you went over the side i went over the side in the port propeller she jumped in and she was swimming around and then she came up and she bumped her head on something she don't know what it was but lucky enough that her hair was always in a bun uh, uh, the bun the hair her hair had caught well protected her skull uh, well a brain it was so the, the 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 hair took most of the blow some say it might have been the propeller some but some say it might have been the keel of the boat we don't know what she hit but then when she surfaced she just said she doesn't know what it was but she said her head just exploded with pain i got a terrific bang on the head mm -hmm. and you know it did occur to me if i get another like that i'll be finished so i let go i met that man after he was telling the story <laughs> And he panics because he could feel this strong hand, yeah. and then I opened my hand and let go. Yeah. And he was a little red-haired, um, um, what do you call it, um, orderly. Yeah. Uh, in the orderly corps, because the medical orderly. Medical yeah. orderly, you see. But you came up all right after you left. Yes, I came up arm. all right, and um, and you know, sort of floated. But the only thing, of course, that nearly absolutely killed me was the first thing that was quite near me when I turned round was an open human head. Yeah. Just... Um, Somebody hit the propeller, so was Yes, yeah. I mean, and it, the thing that, of course, it would uh, come to your mind, it reminded me when my father used to kill a sheep, you know, mm -hmm. and the, yeah. a sheep's head. Yeah. I never saw anything so dreadful. Yeah. and. You could tell from the collar that he was a young and lovely person, you know, yeah. a, a young, uh, it was a soldier, whatever, right. the you know, Red Cross man. Mm -hmm. But um, I floated about, I carried four life belts floating around, because <laughs> I don't swim, you see, I I've never learned to yeah. swim. And so... Um, you swallowed a lot of water. Oh, talk about... I. For, for years after I could feel that cork yeah. you know your mouth full of cork and yeah. you know if you're wretched you brought up right. cork and um, this was a cork insulation from the ship yes from the ship and you see the oil too yeah, yeah. but um, presently I heard a noise and uh, a young man who was partly submerged called out and he, he must have seen it I didn't see it saw the life uh, one of our launches come towards him mm -hmm. and uh, he called out there's a woman in the water she said that she swam to a boat or she came, she came this, this boat came up well, i think it was one of the motor launches and she was looking at this i don't know that this this other boy was trying to get onto the boat but she said he lost an arm and she and he couldn't swim but the the the, the officer or whatever it was on the boat, wouldn't allow him on the boat. And he couldn't swim. She, he wanted the ladies on first and he couldn't swim, but he had no arm. So he drowned. He couldn't swim, so he drowned. He just disappeared below the surface. Uh, she talks about this in her, in her interview. And she said, if I had, she said, if I had a gun, I'd have shot him. That's what she said. If I had a gun, I'd have shot him. Strong woman. And exactly. Oh, she was... Oh, yeah, she, she was a force to be reckoned with. Anyway, um, so the Britannic sank. She said, when the Britannic sank, she said, all the machinery, all the decor and everything, just, you know, everything that was, on, that was loose on the ship just slid with the ship as it just foundered. 
and she said the funnels fell off and with a great roar, the Britannic disappeared. She just slid into the water and she was gone. That was it. And she said that the Britannic was more traumatic to her than the Titanic because of the experience. So she was rescued and years later, she went to the doctor's surgery and she said, this, this doctor gave her an x-ray on her, on her head, of her head, and she said, he said, you must have been suffering migraines all your life. Why? Why? You got a fractured skull. She'd escaped the Britannic with a fractured skull. But she must have suffered with migraines the rest of her life. But she never complained. Never complained. So that's, that's it for the Britannic, but she never... She never spoke about it. She never, there was never a um, inquiry into the sinking. There was a few, there was supposed to be, but it was canceled during, because of the war effort. Uh, but there was an admiralty report into the sinking and a casualty report into the sinking. I have those reports. <laughs> I have the reports and I've read them. And both conclusions said that it was probably a mine that she struck. Violet afterwards, she she went back to sea with the Red Star Line and then she went from there and then she went back with the White Star Line in the 1920s. She went and served on the Olympic, the Titanic's older sister and the Britannic. So you imagine this woman had survived not only the Britannic, but also the collision with the Olympic and then the Titanic sinking. And then she went back in the 1920s to work on the Olympic again. This woman was rock. She must have been made of rock or steel or something. Because if I'd seen a ship very similar to the ships that I'd survived, nope, not happening, happening. But Violet wasn't the only Titanic survivor that was on the Britannic. There was Arthur John Priest and Archie Jewell. Arthur survived the Olympic as well, was on the Olympic when she collided with the Hawk. We wouldn't say they survived because the Olympic didn't sink. But she, he'd survived the Titanic sinking and then he survived the Britannic. But Arthur went on to survive other shipwrecks too. No more than five shipwrecks. So but Arthur was also unsinkable. Um, Archie Jewell was one of Titanic's six lookouts. He wasn't on the Olympic, but he was on the Titanic. Then he survived the Britannic. He was on the Britannic as an able seaman. Mm -hmm. And then he survived her. And it was said that he was also caught in the propeller because he wrote a letter, a very detailed letter to his sister about the incident. And he goes into great detail of how he survived. Wow. And it's very, very, it sends chills down your spine because unlike, unlike Violet, she talks about it, but she doesn't go into great detail. He did. Wow. And so then he survived the Britannic and then he would board another ship, Archie. would Archie Jewell would also survive. Well, no, he would board another ship a year later after the Britannic. And he was on this ship with Arthur John Priest, who had, who had just survived the Britannic and the Titanic with him. And then he was on another hospital ship in around, I think it was April 1917. And... It was called the HMHS Donegal, which was a hospital ship. She'd been she was torpedoed in the English Channel. Arthur survived, but Archie didn't. He didn't survive, and he was only 29 at the time. So, yeah, I had to go into them because obviously Violet's one of only three that survived. So Violet, going back to Violet, she survived, and then she had a brief marriage. In 1923, she got married on the 29th of October, 1923, to a John James Lewis. Very brief. They had, no, but I don't know what the arrangement was. But she fell in. I don't know whether she fell in love. Or it was just an arrangement. But he also worked on ships too, and they got married. And I think the marriage only lasted five months, and they were oh. divorced. And during that time, they never had any children. And it was the only marriage that Violet ever had. So I don't think she was, I don't know whether it was him or her, but 
I don't think she was really the committed woman. She was, I think she was a free spirit, I think. And I think she just liked to be her own person, I think. Violet then would, she, she would finally retire in 1950 from the sea. But she worked all her life. She had more than 30 years at sea. And then she finally retired in 1950. And then she, um, she, she retired and then she went and got a, she retired to a cottage. She made a friendship with John Graham Maxton. And uh, she, now Violet only really made very rare appearances to Titanic related stuff. She never took any interviews really. And she, never really attended anything. The only thing that she attended was the premiere of A Night to Remember, the 1958 movie. Uh, there's a picture of her with uh, Eva Hart, who was another Titanic survivor. Uh, and there's also another photograph with, with her with a glass of wine uh, with uh, Lawrence Beasley and a few other Titanic survivors. Um, and then it all went quiet with her and nothing went. Then she... I don't, I don't know how the conversation started, but John must have persuaded her in some way to do an interview with him. And that's where the interview comes around, which is in the, it, he was writing a book called The Only Way to Cross. And he also wrote her biography. Although she spoke about it, um, she, didn't, she didn't write the book. He actually wrote the book. And um, during the, uh, so, I don't, like I said, I don't know how the conversation started, but she must have agreed somehow, whether well, it was under, under conditions that this wouldn't be shared with anybody but him. And then, the, so the voice recording, it's, it was done in 1970, so a year before Violet died, she passed away, before she passed away. And, um, I just, I mean, the voice recording is just amazing. I can't wait for people to be able to hear it. The, the detail and, and just hearing her raw material coming out of that amazing woman is just the icing of the cake. It really is. It seems to me, though, hearing Violet's voice is extraordinary because you hear, like, all the written words in documentaries and they're read by actresses. Every single yeah. documentary you see on television or film all actresses, not Violet's real voice. And when I came yeah. across the interview for the very first time, I was like, oh my God. Like literally, yeah. oh my God. Is that what Violet sound like? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a lot of, there was a lot of myths going around or uh, not, ac not accusations, more um, assumptions that she may have suffered with a stutter because of the head injury and the, you know, the accent that she spoke with. Violet's, obviously didn't suffer with a stutter from the from telling from the voice recorder. At least if she did, she got some speech therapy later and, and obviously it, that just went. Uh, but she didn't, stu she didn't stutter and she was a very straight lady. And even she, she was a very fun lady, but she knew who she was. She knew the person she was and she knew how to get that across. And that's what I find amazing. And she does speak slightly, if you listen to it very slightly, she does have an Argentinian ting, tinge to her accent. Um, not much, there is that bearing English accent, but there is that tinge. In some of the, you know, uh, pronouncing issues, she, she does have that, that tinge to it. So unfortunately, certainly Violet passed away. Uh, the unsinkable lady did die in the end in 1971, um, aged 83. Uh, but her legacy that she left behind has outlived her. I, I think it will just carry on till, until we're gone because she's a beacon. She is a beacon to anything's possible, even in the most difficult circumstances anything is possible i mean i know she was actually called miss unsinkable but i like to think of her as 
And I don't re re really want to steal Margaret Thatcher's catchphrase. I think she was the, well, Violet Jessup was the early Iron Lady. Uh, I think as so. well. Where did the term Miss Unsinkable come from? Because I've always wanted to know how did it came about? I don't know. I mean, I think it's just one of those things that has been, um, I don't think she ever saw herself as unsinkable. I mean, I don't have ever hear Violet ever saying that she was unsinkable. I mean, even John Graham Maxton didn't even make you know mention that in a, the book or ever title that. I think it was just it, it's a bit like uh, Margaret Brown, you know, uh, Margaret Brown. Um, she, I mean, obviously in the newspapers they claim that she was unsinkable. So and I think that's just attached it uh, attached you know the unsinkable so i think when, once people heard that she'd survived all these shipwrecks that they placed that unsinkable you know that name that that um name tag on her i think it just followed her legacy i don't think i don't think it was ever mentioned or ever said to her personally or said to her while she was alive i think it's just something that's carried on after um after a passing i think it's just People have learned so much, and again, this is this goes back to a, a great desire of wanting to learn everything about Titanic. And then, you know, you've got two thousand passengers where that's crew. I think if you if you learn about Titanic, you learn about the Olympic, you learn about Britannic, you are going to come across Violet. And I think once you know, listen to her story, and know her story, then you can see why that name was given to her, just like with Margaret Brown. But you see, Margaret, she only survived one sinking. She survived two sinkings, Violet. And again, it's the same with Arthur John Priest. Arthur John Priest has now been known as the unsequel stoker. That's because he survived all these shipwrecks. It might have not been his name or his nickname during his lifetime, but it might have been something that's just carried on with legacy, with with his legacy after his death. I think everybody has that legacy. I mean, I'm I'm called Mr. Britannic, you know, uh, but you see, you know, again, it, I don't, I don't know. It's just something that attaches to people, whether that them being alive or after. I, I don't know where it came from, but <laughs> something started, <laughs> something started it and someone did start it, but it, it, it's attached to her now. So <laughs> every oh, time no. you say Miss Unsinkable, you know who she is. <laughs> It's like a lyric, you know, when you when you get a song stuck in your head, you don't know, and it just goes round and round in your head. And you might have not listened to the song in years, but it's there, isn't it? I think it's just something that just, it, someone plants a seed and then it just goes on and, and it just grows to a wider audience. And that's what happened with Violet. The unsinkable seed was planted on her name and then it just grew with, with her legacy. and. And the more and more people that learn about Violet, the more people will learn that she was Miss Violet, Violet just uh, Miss Unsinkable. Then it goes to another audience and another audience, and it just grows and grows and grows. And then it just gets stuck. So. <laughs> oh, that so there you go. Oh, that's brilliant, though. And I think we're going to wrap up the interview there because we've learned so much about Violet. And there are some bits I never heard before, but I know that her story will live on. So, Jake, thank you so much for coming thank on. Thank you. But if you'd like to hear the full interview as well, I will leave a link in the description box down below on Spotify and on YouTube as well. Go check the interview out. It's amazing. And yeah, I definitely think we'll definitely wrap it up there. I know I could go on about it, but if I need to, me too. <laughs> As you but can it's... tell, I like to talk. <laughs> 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 but, sorry guys <laughs> but you are always welcome to come back as well Jake because we definitely need to know more about like other survivors as well but yeah. yes that was, that was absolutely amazing Jake thank you so much thank and you so then, much yeah and until then guys and I'll catch you very soon thank, thank you. you so much Bye. Jake if you enjoyed this week's episode please subscribe for more historical content until next time, this has been History Inside a Nutshell, departing from the docks. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage. <laughs>